Hi, I'm Bill Kleitz. The material that I'll be covering in this podcast is out of my Digital Electronics 9th Edition textbook. I hope you find it useful. Hi, this is Professor Kleitz, and in Chapter 1 we're going to talk about number systems and codes. We'll talk about uh, the comparison between digital versus analog signals. We'll look at all the different digital representations we have for analog quantities. And then we have to go through all the number systems and try to determine how to form binary numbers, octal numbers, hex numbers. And then we'll look at uh, some of the uh, codes that are available, like binary coded decimal, and look at the ASCII code for entering uh, characters and symbols. Digital circuitry is the foundation of digital computers and many automated control systems. You think about the modern electronics today, you know, we have smartphones, we have digital cameras, you think about the ATM machine, DVD players, any kind of music reproduction, digital circuitry is all around us. However, the world naturally is analog in nature, so we'll take a look at how we convert all of the analog quantities that we deal with in a natural world into digital signals so that we can use digital uh, automation to control uh, any kind of op any kind of factory automation or any kind of home consumer products other uses for digital circuitry include automated machine control any kind of factory that has sensors or transducers that run a conveyor or any kind of robotics or anything like that, the foundation of all that is digital electronics, digital circuitry. The reason we use digital electronics is it evolved from the principle that transistor circuitry could easily be fabricated and designed to output uh, one of two voltage levels. So a transistor, what we're going to see is we're going to either turn it on or turn it off indicating a one or zero level which creates what's what we call the binary numbering system so let's take a look at the difference between analog versus digital first of all an analog waveform as you can see in figure 11a is a smooth continuous type waveform it has an infinite number of various levels that it could be. And so if you looked at a plot of voltage versus time, the voltage may increase slowly and then here it's decreasing and so on. Whereas digital, when you look at a digital signal versus time, over time it's either on or off. Here it's off, here it's on. And generally the voltage levels are going to be 5 volts or 0 volts. Or in some cases we have these low voltage digital circuits which will be all the way down to well, maybe 1.2 volts and 0 volts. And you you know if you look at a, a wristwatch for example and you've seen uh, an analog wristwatch which just has a smooth continuous movement as it as it goes around clockwise the second hand and the minute hand and so on a digital watch is made up of digital circuitry and you just see this click off the, the minutes and seconds and the date and so on so if we look at a little more detail of the digital signal that gets created. If this was an analog signal that was varying over time and we look in detail at the voltage levels, at some point on this waveform we have to determine what the voltage is and convert it into a digital string of ones and zeros. And we'll see how we do this later in the chapter, but at this point, let's say it's about two volts and the binary representation would be zero 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 one zero. As it moves up to a higher level, we have to take a sample of that point converted into binary or a digital string. And here it is zero 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 one zero. That's actually the number three as we'll see. And the number four, this it's this reaches four volts. This is how we represent the number four. So the circuitry to do that will have an analog signal that's coming in. Now this analog signal could be a temperature level that's changing over time. It could be a pressure level. It could be an optical level. Some sort of an analog signal will output a voltage and we take a sample of that voltage at one particular instant in time send it into an analog to digital converter and come out with a binary string or a digital string and this is the digital string for here's the two volts analog here's the number two in binary 
Another application is in the case of analog sound reproduction. As you know, when we produce uh, sound, if somebody's singing into a microphone, this is a, actually just producing a change in pressure levels within the room as we sing. And this is all analog information. That analog information goes into a CD recorder, which is really an A to D converter. So it takes a sample of this person's voice many times per second, some cases 128,000 times per second. It'll take a sample of their voice, convert it to digital, burn the CD disc. This is actually a spiral disc. As it spins, it, the laser will be putting pits or lands, a pit being a 1 and a land being a 0. And the pit is just a spot where the CD laser burns a hole in the disc or a pit. And it spirals out from the beginning all the way out to the outer. And this digital information, in order to be played back in analog version, has to go through a D to A conversion, digital to analog. Now we have an analog value that has to go into an audio amplifier, which boosts the value of the signal so a human can hear it and play it out through a loudspeaker, which then produces the pressures in the room at a louder, at a louder value or an amplified level. So, of course, you may ask, why do we bother converting from analog to digital and then have to go back from digital to analog? And I'll try to show you why we do this by observing figure 1-4. An analog signal is susceptible to electrostatic noise. You know, things like fluorescent lights or a refrigerator or a motor starting will inject small imperfections on a smooth analog waveform. And these irregularities will be amplified and reproduced uh, in, in an audio system or in any other kind of an analog recording mechanism. And remember, analog could be the recording of temperature, or pressure, or optics, or anything else, too. So these imperfections are not good. Whereas in a digital signal, we have a low, and then we have a high, and then maybe this low's got some electrostatic noise on it. Well, it's just going to be millivolts in level. It still looks like a low or an off. This high over on this section, yeah, it's sitting at 5 volts and may bounce up and down, maybe 5.1 or 4.9, but it still looks like an on. So inject, injecting uh, noise into a digital signal has no problem in the reproduction or the storage of the ones and zeros. And that's a good thing. One application of an analog to digital converter might be in the case of solar energy data logger. Now in this case what I'm trying to show is five possible analog inputs going into a data logger which will just record these analog values in a personal computer. We all know about the USB interface but first of all the data logger has to convert this analog information into a digital string, send it across the USB connector into a personal computer or some other digital system to create a, a database of all these all these values. And of course we can dump that off to a printer or we could send it up to the internet or whatever via some other USB interconnect. What's inside this data logger is an analog to digital converter. First of all the multiplexer is used to select which of the solar panel inputs we're going to send into the A to D converter. So the A to D converter can only operate in one analog signal at a time. So the multiplexer, which is covered in chapter 8, is going to select, let's say, solar panel number 0, how much solar energy is being received at that instant, it sends it through the analog to digital converter, which will come out with an 8-bit string or a greater number of bits, a string, into some database management and storage operation. There's going to be a real-time clock, which is, going to put, which is going to put a time stamp on this analog value this digital information with the timestamp is going to go into some sort of a parallel data bus to serial USB converter. This is called a shift register and we'll cover that in chapter 13. This is going to come out with a single line USB universal serial bus output and back up in this other figure. That's what is fed back into the personal computer. Later we may scan solar panel 1 and then solar panel 2 then solar panel 3. We may want to know how much solar radiation is striking the Earth at each of these times. So the pyranometer actually measures how many uh, 
watts or kilowatts are being received per square meter at the location of these solar panels. So again, the multiplexer will scan first this input, then this, then this, then this, then this, then go back, this, 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 and keep scanning around one at a time. Each one of these analog values converted into a binary string, a digital string, stamped with a real-time clock value. All this parallel information is converted into serial, sent over the USB, and sent up into our personal computer. So this completes sections 1 and 2. So next what we'll look at is how to come up with these binary strings and how to c come up with the correct values from the analog input and how to come up with those ones and zeros that we need for the digital systems. So that's it for now.